Yeah, do okay, uh, let's start the meeting. It's five o'clock. Thank you. Um, all this regular meeting to order of Kids Pass County Public Hospital, District right. Number One. Uh, first up, uh, approval of the agenda. I do have one quick addition under Education Board reports. I thought that uh, commentary might uh, report back a little bit on what they did in, at the AJ meeting in San Antonio. So we'll put that up ahead of the other. Um, Otherwise, any other changes to the agenda? Yes, sir. Can I add a uh, one day board retreat that Justin would like to talk to you about? Is that under education board? That would be under new business. New business. <laughs> All right. Any other additions to the agenda or changes? Okay, so there are those two additions the one under education board reports and then the one under new business. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Second. Okay. Motion by Erica, second by Terry. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 You never ask for a name. Well, it's easy to count to five. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we have the consent agenda. Hopefully, you guys have had a chance to review the minutes of the board, last board meeting, the approval of the checks, uh, the foundation report, and the finance committee. Any uh, changes to the consent agenda? Okay, I'm uh, hearing none. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent. Okay, motion by John, second by uh, yeah. All right, so uh, there's no further discussion. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Now it's time for public comments and comments and announcements. Um, if there's anybody who has a comment or announcement, please try to keep it to three minutes and begin by introducing yourself and giving your uh, address. Uh, please keep in mind that the board doesn't typically respond to comments uh, when they're made. Is there anybody here who would like to make a public comment or announcement? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on then. Uh, first up, we have a presentation. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you very much. All right. So, so Justin, would you mind uh, doing a roll call, please? Yeah. Matt Altman. Here. Bob Davis. Here. John Ward. Here. Erica Libanow. Here. Terry Clark. Here. Julie Peterson. Here. Scott Lander. Here. Dr. Kevin Martin. Dr. Roberta Hobby. I think she's, she's here. Uh, Amanda Scott. Here. Michelle Whirl. Here. Mandy Olson. Here. Vicki Machuro. Here. Dee Dee Utley. Hi, this is Dr. Hoppy. I'm sorry I'm here. I just had technical problems as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I think I see Dee Dee as well there. And then uh, Rhonda Holden. Here. Stacey Olea. Here. Jeff Yamada. Here. Rhonda. Uh, just just to, to help my animal brain next time, would you mind under uh, call the regular meeting to order in the next uh, agenda? Just put all call on it. Yes, sir. Thank you for reminding me. All right. Um, so first up, we have a presentation from Terry Clark, who attended the Wishes Governing Board uh, committee meeting in Olympia. Uh, Terry. Hi. Okay. So um, I uh, had uh, included in the, uh, the, the board packet two items that they uh, they discussed basically 100%. And then the other thing was uh, uh, there was a person talking there. And they asked us to stand up and lean to the left and lean to the right. And they were hoping that their comments about what they were going to talk about would move them as much as she just moved them. So anyway, so I was thinking about doing that to you, but I didn't want to move you that much. Thank All you. right. So anyway, uh, the, the health equity is uh, something that needs to be done and having that uh, uh, reported uh, uh, the, the hospital do uh, a review and report that as something 
And I just thought that would be really good for people to see this and uh, review it. And I wasn't going to chat much about it. And then also, I thought it would be very good for you to review the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, financial woos that they also talked about there, uh, which uh, what talked about how hospitals were losing money and stuff. And I thought it would be good for you to review what other hospitals are doing in the state and do something else. And then uh, the day after that meeting, uh, they had an advocacy and 140 people uh, that are associated with Washington State Hospital Association and some of them for the government's board, but I, I didn't go to it because there was just way too many people. At all day with every legislator person in the state of Washington. And one of the things they were pushing a lot was to increase the amount that Medicaid pays on uh, the bills that we had, we do. And one of the things that they also talked about by having such poor payment from Medicaid based upon uh, what we bill, and it's around 50 cents for every dollar that we bill. Uh, is that right, Scott? For us, it's uh, about 44 cents on a dollar. Oh, so, well, we only get 44 cents. And one of the things they associated with the health equity in this is by having such low payments that really impacts health equity in communities because consequently, you're not getting a lot of good payments. And there's a lot of doctors, especially down in Yakima, I know that, that will not see Medicaid patients because they're not being reimbursed. But consequently, their health equity uh, in that region is really bad. So unless you have any other questions, I was going to let Matt zoom down the agenda to the next item. Any questions? Okay, well, I hope I did move you, but I hope I just moved you to the left or right and not around in a circle. All right. well, thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, and we appreciate you uh, representing us uh, there and on the governing board. Yeah, well, the next governing board meeting is going to be up in Chelan same time that we will be up there in June. And so uh, consequently, uh, I might be able to whine a little more about it at the next uh, uh, meeting, but uh, I was really excited about being on the governing board for the state of Washington when they nominated me and asked me to please do it. Yeah. And so I thought, yes. So great, yeah, we, uh, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much, sir. All right, next up, uh, first report is from Mandy Olson uh, with quality. Actually, we have another presentation from Linda. Right. I figured that uh, Mandy would oh, want to pass I, it off. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, welcome to Mandy Olson. What I'm going to share is kind of a comprehensive summary of the um, 2022 Compliance Committee activities following some of the basic compliance elements of, of an effective compliance program. And that's with the, the written summary that was presented to you. Just a few things to, um, that I wanted to highlight to you is that um, you recognize on page 24 that there was uh, an additional standing agenda item to our compliance committee. So with us being uh, now certified to doing uh, and there's also other interoperability um, Compliance things um, that can be reported to the committee, so we're up to date on what actions are being taken. Now we're, we're doing our best to meet those reg um, regulatory requirements. That's reporting out monthly um, by Mandy Olson. Quality on um, the following page of page 25, and privacy. There's a uh, continuous, uh, you know, efforts made to help uh, staff be made aware of, of where there's some concerns with um, potential for privacy breach and when that occurs. Uh, there's uh, some prompt feedback to the staff and help them understand what a better way is to obtain information um, if they have a, a concern related to a patient. And so Cindy Kelly and her team work uh, well along with directors to ensure we're looking at systems and processes to make sure we can kind of solidify that as well. Uh, one of the big um, pushes that we had for um, 
trying to secure uh, patient information as well as organization information was uh, the cybersecurity education. And you heard a lot about the, the phishing exercises, and that was something that Jeff and and his team led. And um, many of you, I'm sure, got these um, emails that looked almost um, like they were legitimate and may have received feedback um, if you had clicked on them. So that uh, we had a baseline rate in June when they first started of 22.5%. And, and by the end of December, they're showing the last limit, the December rate is showing 8.2%, uh, 5% is going to be the target for next year. But definitely improvement for that. And there was uh, a lot of effort made um, by their team to ensure that we're doing what we can to help stop the line of those potential breaches. The um, Page 26 on the compliance investigations, there's quite a bump up this year compared to 2021. Uh, we had six in 2021. Uh, there was a communication from the board that we uh, wanted to hear more of how many times really the compliance uh, was approached um, from staff with any concerns or, or leader concerns, and that there was some sort of interaction, uh, whether it was just education or a full investigation. So there was more reporting into the investigation log, and so uh, that big bump up was more a reflection of that. And then on page uh, 27. Well, right Linda, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So uh, if I understand this, when you say 31% of the reports substantiated, so that's the idea that 31% were actually compliance uh, uh, Concerned, or you know, something that actually violated uh, an actual policy or rule that we're supposed to do. And the uh, other 69% uh, turned out to be um, not something that's uh, that actually was in compliance. Right. So it was more of a perception of the reported that they thought that it was a violation of uh, either a policy or you know, a regulatory um, cycle. Need to be so, okay, yes. Yeah, violation. That's the word. Yeah. Can I also ask a question? Yes. So, uh, under compliance committee, uh, I see John Ward there, and I'm also on the committee too. So, am I invisible to you? Do you not? I believe you're probably the alternate. Yeah. Sorry. I imagine you're yeah. the alternate. Well, uh, back when we signed the committee, they they had a vote pool on the committee, didn't they, John? Yeah, I'm off as of the first of January. I let them know that. Yeah. And, and I'll so, make sure um, I will. Where are you looking to? Uh, up the up on the, that I will under the second one. one. That they said changes in the committee in 2022 mm -hmm. to state the open, but they don't say anything about the changes. So I, I hope I'm not invisible to you. No, and, and, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's no problem. Yeah. If I, even though if I was invisible, I still would be at the committee. You are, all, you are on all of the, the agenda and the, um, and the documents showing that you're a participant and part of the committee. So yeah, make sure that being on that committee and listen to people talk about their compliance reports, I really believe that we, we do a lot of really good compliance in this organization uh, because listening to other problems in other organizations here and there. Uh, they have a lot more issues in their compliance than we do. Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure Linda would be happy to. Yes. Oh, so no note that on the report. Okay. That we also were. All right. No problem. Yeah. And new additions to the committee and we. Pardon? I'll ensure that I update this report to, re to reflect that you are part of the committee. Yeah. That, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I could be. John Quinn, then. It's okay. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be okay. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for doing that, Linda. You're welcome. And so on page 27 regarding uh, conflict of interest disclosure statements. So we did have a process in place to bring uh, any potential concerns uh, for a conflict of interest to the committee so that the committee could review the, the uh, action plan to mitigate those. There were two of them brought to the committee and the fans have appropriate plans. So that process seems to be working well, and it seems that the committee members were appreciative to have an opportunity to look at those. Well, we continue on the next page showing that we have um, uh, ongoing auditing that's done to make sure that we're um, coding well and there's documentation to support that. 
And so by having an outside review um, for that, um, we can get good feedback and that was noted regarding HIM coding. The other within the 340B program, so that program um, has um, been a great asset to the organization to support um, pharmacy services. And so as expected, we knew at some point that there would be an audit from FERSA, so that occurred in May. Uh, they, there were a few findings um, and a, uh, a corrective action plan was submitted. At the time I submitted this report, we uh, had not heard if they approved it or not. We did get an email back recently saying they would just like some additional information. So uh, Rhonda and Nassar had probably followed through with that. And then on page 29 related to no data on uh, I'm looking at the element number six regarding some ongoing <clears throat> auditing monitoring. And so within that, uh, you've probably seen with there's 94 recalls under the data showing that uh, products that were had to be evaluated because of notices from manufacturers. That's a large bump up from last uh, 2021 to 50. There's uh, a lot going on that materials management, pharmacy, and the facility, facility management staff do to evaluate those recalls and make sure anything that we're using for patients care, uh, if there is a corrective uh, evaluation of the product, as a form of product, that they um, took prompt action for that. So, and that's reported out to the safety committee as well. And then on uh, the final page of just noting on page 30 is that, you know, in 2000, uh, January 2021, Cindy Kelly, which is the director of HIV and the private league officer, she has uh, taken on the role of compliance officer. Uh, I feel really confident that she's going to do extremely well. She has an excellent background and, and already conducting investigations for privacy concerns and, and leading a large um, department that has a, a lot of regulatory um, um, adherence that's necessary for that. And Suzette platform is also her compliance specialist, which I do with Cindy Kelly and Suzette. And they will be, uh, for this year, they will be following through with additional reporting to board for a summary and will report out to the committee for that. The other is the work plan just showing you were able to see if we met targets or not. And the only thing outstanding on that is there was a plan to have a contract management. How do you describe it? The scope of practice for contract management. And we recognize that's one of the areas that we really need to have to find better to ensure that we have um, good. Um, or it, uh, especially service contracts, and are we are these companies providing service that is expected, and what is that follow up on on recontracting, and having a, a good audit for that? So that will continue in 2023. So there's nothing uh, really new on that. We already talked about the pitching exercises. We, we set the target to five percent. Anything else? Uh, I was just going to comment about the 340B program because I review a lot of information about that. And that's also a very big financial thing for the hospital. Because the uh, docs talked about how much money that 340B program helps for us. And Nasser is a wonderful master of that program because he does a really good job, even though in some of the audits, he has to do a little better things because there's a lot of pressure on the 340B plan because a lot of the pharmacy the pharmacy drug companies are trying to get it to go away. But I really hope that we can continue to do that. But there's also a lot of pressure to continue it. But uh, we have a great pharmacy director here. And Nasser, like I said, is a really good master of the 340B program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions about the compliance report for my Thank you for coming to the next meeting. Appreciate it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say uh, to the board? We're looking forward to working with you. Uh, continue the good work that Linda's done. She's been fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's good to know that uh, that 
the <coughs> clients program will be a good one. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll go to uh, Mandy Olson with the quality, quality improvement report. Uh, Mandy? Hi, the report starts on page 16, and um, I really don't have anything to add except that um, I would like to point out on the blood product documentation, all of those instances were actually traveled. Um, and for every time that we do have a failure, Vaughn Gibson is following up with those staff. To, and um, she had an instance in particular where she had to meet with one traveler, and there were quite a few early for that one person. So we hope that that will number, the percentage will continue to increase now that we've, we think we've captured kind of one of the outliers for that, um, providing some education and orientation to um, our process for documenting in the in the record. Thanks so much. Great. And other than that, I mean, how could we this is the purpose of the program is to notice uh, problems and improve. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Oh, uh, the other thing I'd just say is on this is the quarterly we have the patient satisfaction dashboard. Um, and Every single area except for two were at Target. Um, you know, the emergency department was one of the ones that was not at that 75% top box. They are historically lower than all other areas of organization. So that target may be a little high for the emergency department. Um, but if them and CCU are the only ones, I'll, I'll also point out that sort of CCU had a much lower um, response rate. Yeah. So you know, one person that ranks us lower and it really can drop that uh, percentage too. So um, not sure what was going on that quarter with response rate from there. And volumes were really, really, really high during that time and transfers were very difficult. So uh, that means some of what was going on there, but we'll keep, we'll keep watching that. Are there any questions for Andy, about the report or the dashboard. So, Andy, the referral coordinator that was hired is Alan Gosson, and a successful hire. And... I have to have to think about that, but it's it looks like it has been helpful for this data. Mm -hmm. I, I would say yes. Having dedicated staff that the phone call that used to focus on referral, making sure they go out, making sure patients are contacted, and then closing the loop. Runs a little smoother that way. Rip. Angelo is enthusiastic at data sharing. Any other questions? Uh, for Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have the CEO report. Uh, so the first thing I will do is I my, my incorrect in my report. I thought Barry Dolph was going to have the two days and all that. Yes. So. Um, rather than with the government meeting. So I reported incorrectly in my report. Um, so one of the things I wanted to let the board know is we have had some uh, interest from the community in restarting our cancer support group. So we have included the foundation and uh, KCHN and a number of internal folks. I think that's going to be led by Kyle West and uh, Trisha Senek to see what means we might be able to do for the community in terms of cancer support. So, other than that, it's been, it's been very busy. I'm happy to answer any questions. We are moving forward with um, working through some details on the new anesthesia plan. I'm uh, hoping to transition in the next couple of months to the anesthesia provider. That seems to be a long time. Uh, about the field house, you, you say that you'll engage with the city. What what sort of role do you think uh, the hospital will play in that process? You know, I don't know. And it was interesting because um, there, I don't think they know yet how, how this is going to come together and whether there's going to be an opportunity for partnering somehow. Um, they, so I have not had a chance to meet with Heidi about it yet. Uh, and I think what I'm asking, and 
this has actually led to a larger conversation that I would like to address with the board in our one day retreat that we're going to talk about. Um, how does the board want to engage in the conversation about community wellness? And what is our role? There's the field house project that's coming up. Rhonda's working with a group in Upper County that's looking at a fitness center in Upper County. We have um, requests from a group that does outdoor education um, with kids called Teen Group. I, and there's a lot, you know, we, our vision specifically calls out our work with the community and families and improving health. And what is that going to look like is the, I don't want to overcommit. Um, and it's not just the financial sort of arrangement. It's, it's also a, how do we know what a good fit is, who the good partners are, and what is our role? I mean, it, is it, do we only partner when, you know, we have a presence and we can brand with with the organization, with the city or the county or someone. Um, so a lot of these are kind of opportunities are coming at us and I would like to work with the board at our retreat to really develop a philosophy. And I think part of the philosophy and the screening process is that criteria about what is it we want to do and what makes a good partner and kind of having some sort of tool that we can go through the sort of Great, but, I think that'll be a good conversation. Okay. In the meantime, I want to be at the table with the city saying, what might this look like? What are you going to do in there? I I firmly, firmly believe that we have a place in improving the health and wellness, getting upstream, so to speak, um, in our community. I just haven't had enough conversation with that one this time. This whole idea excites me and it's really um, gratifying to be part of an organization that has the bandwidth to consider this, the strength and resources to, to consider that. So, well, and I think part of what um, this is as much collaboration as it is of the financial component of it, and I want to make sure that's what we're presenting. Um, I think you know, right now, sort of our go-to answer is we have some great resources in business development in Trisha, and you know, she knows how to help people work through the numbers. We have Mitchell that we offer to help do grant writing and things like that. So we're we're moving in that direction and we're always pushing the partnership. So we're always saying, well, let's get KCHN or public health to the table. But there is really exciting work to do out there, and I think a rich conversation to be had about how we engage in that. Okay. Yeah, appreciate it. Updates on the MRI for us folks. Um I, well I will feel free to jump in if there's updates from <laughs> where we're at. Um so we can't get started on the construction project until the Existing MRI is decommissioned and out of the modular building, modular that's been there for 30 years. So, um, so we're working with Acumen to because it's their MRI. Um, they are supposed to have a crane in place to do that. They're going to take it out through the roof and remove it, and shortly thereafter, that building will be level. They're going to do that on March 6th. Ideally. We would have a mobile unit here a couple of weeks ahead of time to get the protocols loaded, everybody trained on it. Acumen is also responsible for delivering that mobile to us. It's going to be a much tighter timeline than we had hoped. So the current magnet is decommissioned on the 6th. That mobile will be here on the 1st. Um, we rattled some changes, changes and got a little harder with so they have the mobile we're getting, they're actually taking from someone else's site. So somebody's mad at us because they don't have MRIs for two weeks. Um, but we're also stealing somebody's tech who's going to come on the first. Yeah. So the tech will be here on the first, and they will um, help us with protocols because it's quite expensive to load those into the machine. We're going to actually try to use the protocols that they already have loaded because it sounds like they might be pretty good. So we're going to try that first. Um, but the tech will be here on the first to train our staff 
um, on the use of that MRI. And then we do also have special applications training um, the following week. So we will be, um, the first day <laughs> will be just a half day of scanning, and then we'll do um, patients every other hour so that they can troubleshoot if they need to and adjust anything that they need to. And Kimmy's already got it all planned out for the following couple of weeks to build up gradually. So we'll probably be um, fully functional at the end of two weeks. So it has been a, a big scramble. Rhonda and, and Kimmy and Rob have absolutely arm wrestled uh, Ackman in the setting up and doing what they needed to do. So it's been a wrestling match. <laughs> so. well, I know that uh, you did all sorts of work way back when on the digital mammography yet. So I think having you advocate for us is, is good. I, I, I think it's good to have you on the, on the lead. Yeah, I know. It's good to have you on, on our side. Um, I got a question about the MRI. That there's a, uh, been a national shortage on helium, and they use helium uh, in the MRI machine to, at uh, least they used to, use it uh, as one of the cooling things. Have we had any impact? Uh, because of that potential shortage? We have not. Okay, no. that's good. Yeah. John, did you have a follow up? Yeah, I was just going to say so it's a tight time frame, and you guys have worked around. Do you have any remaining serious concerns with the plan that you've come up with? You... Well, I would say, you know, we have had some trust issues with the company following through on what they say they're going to do. So, so there's still know. a until it's actually here and happening, you're going to be a little yeah. suspicious. Well, I think I think it will be here. I'm not really doubting that at this point. But I, I guess my concern is, you know, should it go down in the future, have problems, how responsive are they going to be to our needs? Because it's been a real challenge with communication with them. And so you'll have approximately two weeks of training on this new system. But the old system will be turned off five or so days after this arrives. So part of that training it's on the only machine we have that's an MRI on campus at that point. Yeah. It is going to be a full schedule MRI. Yeah. It was slower until the bugs are worked out, so to speak. So this mobile is coming from Wenatchee, which makes me feel better than I probably heard it was coming up from Arizona or something. I mean, so is the tech, right? Yes. So we think we, we can go get them if we have to. <laughs> I'll drive the truck. <laughs> And then once the crane removes the old MRI, demolishes that building, Walker can get down to their schedule and get started on, on that whole expansion project. And Michelle will be letting you know that there is a golden shovel ceremony planned for before the March board meeting. So plan for a photo op. Photo op for Matt. Yeah, right. I think I'll <laughs> yeah. Other questions for Julie? So, yeah, on the um, <clears throat> field house with the rec center, like what, from the hospital's perspective, what kind of things could we help with? Like, there... So, so again, our commitment to improving the health of the community is embedded in our mission and our vision. Um, so, so we could have a statement that says. Um, our wellness, we want to focus on active living um, or active communities for senior population or for, um, you know, children or youth. We want to focus our wellness on those kinds of activities. So in this case, we would say we're attracted to this project because for six months out of the year, it's the only indoor um, field opportunity for soccer and and uh, roller derby and pickleball and, and tennis and we feel that it will see serve this many people and it will keep people active um, we could also so I was asking Heidi you know are you looking for leasing opportunities or you know a, you know how do you see this mechanism working and I don't think they've figured that out yet but, um, you know, we did some creative things in Prosser to keep a fitness center open by leasing their pool so that they were able to do the upgrades they needed and do and create a parking lot and things like that. So we have an interest in that. And then a project would have to demonstrate that they meet that need. 
So they're talking about doing an indoor running walking track. Um, you know, that would be something where we would say that's an opportunity for KBH to make sure that when it's icy outside, too cold for seniors to go walking the way they typically would, there's a place for us to help the community create groups that would do laps and, and keep seniors busy during the winter months. So could we, is it, could we like do something like we're going to help with the, some of the cost of the you know, flooring or treadmills or stuff like that? So I, I, I don't know what the art of possible is, but if Julie had, if I had my way, you drive up to a field house that was the uh, Ellensburg field house with the KBH logo yeah. on it that says, you know, health and wellness, right. partnering for health and wellness in yeah. Ellensburg. So, um, and, in, you know, so we would, for that, co-branding and the opportunity to participate in programs and um, we would be a financial partner. We already see the video at the AHA. There you go. <laughs> But again, I, that's a super conversation to have. Uh, how how do we? Because there are a lot of projects, and you can't do everything. So who's your target audience? And for you know, there's there's walkable city projects that hospitals have participated in, and, and they're all, they've participated in sidewalks and and streetlights to make cities more walkable. Yeah, and we're going to be talking this uh, talking about this more in our future. Think about the sponsorships for. Many things, but particularly athletic, it's going to be co-branded on the banner or get yeah. McCoy would be so um, refreshing to see yeah. KBH. And you know, some of what Rob was talking about in Upper County is is that the appropriate place? Is that a good spot for PTOP, um, which also gives us an opportunity to you know send our, our trainer up there and maybe do some. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of gym space currently up there. So we do training and cardiac rehab. And Great. Any other Thank questions you. or comments for Jim? Uh, we also have a report from Amanda Scott, the Chief Human Resources Officer. Amanda, did you want to say anything about your report, or just have us ask you questions? Uh, just wanted to point out the animal animal therapy program as you see there that was a very fun immediate effect wellness well initiative but volunteer led so that would be an exciting partnership and people really enjoyed um, orienting and, and giving Vera to tour and thank you for the department to help with that so that's a good effort and then just um that I will be on leave so this will be my last board meeting um until June um but my we are, we are hoping to invite her to the retreat yeah and so, give yeah. her a, a break so, there. I would, I would love to be able to try to do that. And so um, my team will continue to keep the board reports updated. And um, I just like last time, I have lots of senior leader support. So thank you all. And um, so we have some major programs, Team Steps, um, the Experience Healthcare Program, we're, we're looking at starting again um, for high school students and things like that. So you'll get to get a lot of exciting news from my team now and out and work in progress. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I had a question about your first box employee population. Yeah, that's a typo. I uh, apologize. Yeah, uh, yeah. There. no, we didn't lose all of our staff. Okay. I promise in November. I noticed that too. There's another one um, under staff engagement and recognition. There's a cutoff sentence there, so I'm not sure what happened. I apologize with the proof. Okay, um, but we but we will have a calendar of events. Um, the wellness committee and the recognition committee have both been highly engaged and excited for 2023 um, events and initiatives. So. Um, that's where that one there, yes, but thank you, John. Yeah. What, what is it that you're looking at? Uh, the first box, one way population in November, we dropped down to 144 yeah. uh, employees. Oh, okay. it was yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it would be less than our full and part time. Yeah, <laughs> I do want to point out though, if you're if you're looking at the metrics, which I appreciate, thank you for doing that because the team puts a lot of time in that. Um, we're getting some traction on some, uh, we have some, you know, some updates, I think on some, we have three director positions open right now that you might hear from some of the other senior leaders, some traction we're making there. Um, RNs, you know, I think being the department that was fully staffed, is that right? With RNs, except for some PSTs and some other things, but, um, and so we're making some good progress. We saw a hundred more applicants um, in January than December for fewer positions, which is great. So um, we're seeing, we're seeing some hope. We 
<laughs> so when you say fully stuff, that's with actual employees, not just yes. travel. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. At the time, I think. That number in November wasn't a math, a no. math error. It wasn't. It was a typing error. But not it was a typing yeah, error. Yeah, was okay. Serious. All right. Well, thank you for testing us so that we would uh, ask you a question about the typing error, yeah. so that yeah. made us better because you tested us. Thank you. Any other questions from Ed? Thank you, Ed. Anything else, Julie, before we move on? No, sir. Right. Uh, <laughs> next up, operations report. We'll start with Vicki Macharo, CNO. Good evening. I'm on page 40. Uh, just an update. Uh, Ed and I have been working hard on trying to fill Katie's position at ER, and we have uh, been able to find an interim director we will probably start in March of 15. Uh, we were able to do phone interviews and Zoom interviews with uh, this gentleman and seven participants from the ED also uh, were able to join us for that. So we feel really good about that. You're saying this is interim? Yes. Okay. So uh, yes. the length of commitment? Uh, six months to start with. Um, we feel that if we do it any less than that, it's going to be more disruptive to people who come in and go in. And so we would still be searching for of that course. full time person during this. Yeah. And remember, during that time, DD will also be transitioning. So we want to make sure that we're not stretching right. Vicky and DD too fast right now. Uh, like Amanda said, staffing's a little bit better. You know, things change every day. So we do now have an opening. <laughs> but um, we still do have some travelers in place, and it's mostly. To to uh, transition employees, uh, particularly in the ED, it takes a good three or four months to train into that. So we have a couple of, we have one new gentleman who's new to ER. Um, so we've had travelers fill in that position until he's fully trained. Uh, but we've seen a lot of traction. It's, it looks so much better than it did. Um, otherwise, I don't think I have any other what is a virtual dietitian program? So, um, Jim has contracted with two hospitals. Uh, um, it's Whitman, no, Whitman, 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 Whitman. and Whitman. Okay, so that's Colfax. Colfax, so. Uh, as their dietitian, remote dietitian. Um, dietitians are at a premium. We're lucky because Central has a program and we, we get a lot of interest through them, but it's mm -hmm. really hard to find. Dietitians for smaller and, and Whitman, of course, and still Palmer are so much smaller as well. This but. is an arrangement we came to with collaborative the rural collaborative hospital. Oh, right. So he interviews patients. He has not him, but he has a dietitian dedicated to those two facilities who zooms in and remotes uh, to the, their patients and has interviews and assessments. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, the uh, CEO is a Colfax Hospital. Uh, I've known him before, so has Julie. He used to work at Whidbey Island Hospital as the COO when I was over there as the interim pharmacy director. And I, I met him down uh, in San Antonio at the commission. We chatted a lot about his hospital, and he told me uh, a couple things about how supportive uh, KBH is about certain things. So having that uh, Virtual dietitian program is really helping uh, Colfax Hospital out. So that's another wonderful thing. Yeah, great. Any other questions, comments from Vicki? Vicki, can you expand on the, the late shift for Central Sterile? So this is a new trial thing we're doing? Or? Right. So um, normally I think they work from like 6 to 2.30 or 8 to 4.30, but sometimes the surgeries or add-on surgeries run late, and so then all those instruments are sitting there waiting, and then they have to come in the morning and catch up. So Amy's trialing a later shift. I believe it's still 7 p.m., I think. I'm not sure of the hours, but later on in the evening to catch those late cases, particularly the scopes. Those are hard to They're ready to go to the next day. Right, so they're ready to go. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Next up, we have Ron Holden, our Chief Ancillary Officer. My report's on page 42 to 44. 
And I would just uh, want to give a big shout out to engineering and IT for helping us so much in pharmacy with our PIXIS implementation. Um, it's been going very smoothly, but it has required kind of the whole organization, nursing included, to get this um, done. Although Nasser was here for a prior implementation, and he said this one has been much smoother. So that's learning from experience, I guess. Um, we've already talked about our mobile MRI. Our cardiac packs went live today, so we were able to um, work out the last bugs in that system, and so we were able to go live, which is really wonderful. And uh, you'll note that I, I did uh, successfully hire a speech therapist to serve in Upper County, so I'm really excited that she started this week, and she will also be doing home health in Upper County. It's been really hard for our speech therapists that work in Ellensburg to travel up there during their outpatient hours. And so um, I think that's going to be wonderful. And we'll be having her work with our home health staff beginning next week to get oriented on that. Um, under home health and high schools, I'm really excited that our former home health physical therapist uh, called me and she wants to return. Her family had moved to Oregon and they aren't happy there and wants to move back to Ellensburg. So hopefully she will be able to be able to join us in May or June, which will be a big relief to Seth. He's our only therapist we have working with now uh, home health. And other than that, um, I think I put the letters in to really celebrate Jane Davies, our athletic trainer. Um, every year I get letters from the Ellensburg High School to see his crazy and really appreciative of the support that KDH provides to that program. I also have a lot of staff members or community members coming up to me thanking us for Zane because he's taking care of their child. And so they are really recognizing his talents and are very appreciative of the service. Uh, recently, I've had a couple people mention that, how like uh, good he is with the kids and like knowledgeable relate well with them and just yeah I think it's just a really good idea to have that really nice program so thank you for that uh, Roger, if I wanted to find out more about this barcode scanning just to, as a personal interest but I talked to you and I talked to Oscar um probably not there I haven't seen any reports yet since so this is really brand new I don't know if Stacy have you seen any reports on barcode that's cool. Yeah, we're still talking through bugs. Okay. It's really just a curiosity. Yeah. So are you referring to, to medication administration in the hospital and barcode scanning? Yeah. yeah. So we, we were able to glean some information and some data, thanks to Amy, through Cerner. Um, we, um, because we did this prior with our other uh, EMR record, uh -huh. but we've had trouble getting data from Cerner. We finally have that. It wasn't great. And I'm just talking about the hospitals. So I met with the um, nursing safe staffing nurse practice committee and kind of put that on their lap. We had a huge discussion. It was really, uh, actually really, really productive. Um, so we're working, um, each of our directors are working with their staff to increase that. I mean, it's a patient safety initiative and that's what we should be doing. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be seeing some better data come from that. Okay. Yeah, it's, I've, uh, my other work, I've, I've done quite a bit of sort of digging into the Rodaka bond case. Right? I think yeah, this would yeah. be relevant to that. Anyway, I'm just curious. So I, I'll, I'll probably get in touch with you. Yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating. You, you need to scan the medication plus the patients and then make sure that that matches what's on the record. And, yeah. Um, it's, it takes a little more time, but that's the way it needs to be. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But you did have 23 applicants for the farm tech? Yes, thank you. I forgot to mention that. I so far have 23 applicants for the pharmacy tech apprenticeship program. So That's we're great. really excited about yeah. that. And how many, how many openings for that program? Well, we'd like to start with two and then add two more later in the year. So a total of four, but yeah. That's quite a few applicants. So there's also a lot of jobs offered out there for pharmacy techs uh, around us, like down in Yakima, Sunnyside, and a few up here in Ellensburg. So if we train 
these people to be pharmacy techs and they get a job someplace else. It'd be like having the KVA symbol out there because they'll tell how wonderful it is. Because, yeah, because I know a pharmacy tech that is working to be a radiology technician and she came up here to Ellensburg to do training in our radiology department. And that has also been wonderful because she's told me how great it is up here because the radiology technicians do a great job. So every time I see an announcement about students coming into our hospital, we are doing a really good job supporting the community. And we're almost tattooing our forehead with a KVH symbol. Yeah, they will be employed with us though, right, Brenda? Yeah, yeah. They'll be, they will be employed yeah. with us. That's the intent. Of course, you know, they could in the future decide to go elsewhere, yeah. but we'll have yeah, to we don't want that. that. All right. Uh, any other questions for Robin? Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next up, we have Stacey Olea, Chief of Clinic Operations. Stacey. My report starts on page 47. Um, just an addition, I still do not have new patient data for the last month. We switched to counting all appointments by appointments kept versus charges. So the way we have to flush out the new patient appointments is a little bit different. We think we've been working with Amy Diaz. We think we've got it nailed down, but we just need to validate that that information is correct. But we'll have that updated the next time. And then rapid access clinic. April 3rd, April 3rd is still the tentative date. I was hoping we had more providers interested. So uh, we're working with Kat on recruitment for opening that rapid access clinic. You have, uh, uh, you're working with Michelle somehow to make this be uh, known. It will be very popular. Yeah. And the thought is they'll call into their clinic, say, I'd like a same day appointment, and all the PSRs will have access to this schedule and say, we can either schedule you at this time, or if you want rapid access, also just walk in. So you could walk in if you want to be seen. It's like a long shift for one provider or multiple providers sharing a day? 12 hour shift. Okay. So, not that I'm common with providers. Um, it'll be a little bit more of a stretch than the MAs. Right now, the MAs work either eight or 10. So, 12 is a, a little bit adjustment. But we've had, I think, seven applicants for that position. What's really appealing is just three days of work and full time benefits. And then um, the medication scanning, the only thing different we are doing in the clinics is we are not barcode scanning the patients. We're not putting armbands on the patients to receive them, but we are having the MAs do verbal ID checks before giving the meds. I can attest to that. I took my son for his sports physical and also caught up on a, a booster vaccine. Asked all the questions on that question B, so I was like, wait, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a really great visit. And one more comment on rapid access that is for established patients only. So we're not in the urgent care. Yes. What do we count as established? How it will be that you have a primary care physician physician from KBH assigned to you. So if you've so not been seen in how long how recently do you need to have been seen to be considered? Well, yeah. Usually, no. <laughs> I, think, I think it's about 18 months. It's typically three years. Three years? Three yeah. years. Okay. So, if somebody says, Well, I used to go there 18 years ago, you yeah, need to reach out. Okay. Yeah. I really think we're going to, at least initially, as people find this, it is going to be those Monday morning, Friday night calls where you know, people are saying, I sat on this sore throat all weekend long. Can I get into the my doc, the idea is yes, you can on Wednesday, or we have an opening at 10 o'clock at rapid access. Um, it is going to be a soft rollout. We'll be figure out how people move through the system before we sort of blast it out there. Are you going to have any like after hours type? It's we're Scott and I have been working on the hours, and we're probably going to end up from 7 a.m. to about 6 30 p.m. to start. Plus, have a day. 
close to, oh, Saturday, yeah. 12 right. hours on Saturday. So not, not the 9 a.m. to 8 a.m.? No, we're, we're looking at registration staff and we've talked with some people who've done some rapid access urgent cares and there's a strong feeling that that 7 a.m. before the clinic even opens might be really, really valuable to patients. So, so your estimate was 7 to? 7 to 6.30 p.m. Okay, and is this all <laughs> Yes, but not OB. But not we don't want to see OB. Those need to go to women's health. Not OB. That seems hard to the ER to family burden. But speaking of which, you you have my favorite sentence in this whole talking. Uh -oh. We are limiting the OB patients to twenty deliveries a month. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would limit it to one, but <laughs> oh gosh, I think it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other uh, questions for um, I had a, uh, a person comment to me about the medical arts building uh, at the dermatology at the dermatology area there, that's right in the by the front door of the clinic. And they were sitting down there waiting to see Dr. Olcamp, and uh, it was really cold that day because every time somebody would walk into the clinic, the cold air mm -hmm. would blow over to the uh, area he was sitting. And so uh, I bet you this summer we might have the same problem when the hot air will blow there too. So I don't know if we if there's something we could do about it, but uh, uh, he, I asked him how, if he had to sit there longer than he wanted to, and he said no. So consequently, I just thought that'd be something you might want to know about. We can definitely keep that on our radar. <laughs> Any other questions for Stacy? All right, thank you very much, Stacy. Okay. And next up, we have the medical staff. Uh, Dr. Hoppy, you with us? Uh, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yep. 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 Yeah. So um, the medical executive committee um, reviewed a total of twelve applications. Seven were for initial appointment, and five for reappointment. Uh, and so the MEC approved uh, the credentials uh, for these applicants. Um, it's kind of a variety of uh, people joining our team, uh, some family practice, um, one telecardiology, and then obviously some reappointments of current staff. So that's all everybody, I have to report. Everybody on the board has had to review this stuff on the timeline. Uh, do you have any questions or anything for Dr. Hoppy, or, or are we good to uh, make motion? Yeah. One slide. Yeah. When, when I review the, I see that there, perhaps there is a note that they should have puffery for this or, or some sort of a condition. I don't want to be incredibly redundant and then any comments when I say board approved is it assumed that if if that has been do I need to be stating that I approve with those conditions or is approving to say board approved appropriate. But Dr. Avi, did you uh, hear that or would you like me to repeat it? Yeah no can you repeat it? I'm sorry it's kind of hard to hear. So, so Dr. Hobby uh, this is Eric Filippino. Um, when I'm reviewing the files for credentialing and there is a, a, um, and there is a, um, a note that a provider might require proctoring for something or some sort of a condition um, from MEC, do I need to, like some of my fellow commissioners, make a note in there that approve with these conditions or is board approved? Is it understood that those conditions will be in place. Do I need to be typing that in the comments when I say board approved? Yeah, I don't think so. I think that it's kind of understood um, within MEC that that proctoring will occur. Okay. And so I don't think you need to comment there. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Dr. Hoppe, um, the additional postings you have listed of the various uh, provider positions, are we getting any traction or interest in any of those categories? Or are you what? talking? That's Dr. Marks. Uh, oh, that's we're not. Oh. Yeah, we're not quite. All there. right, I, I'll, let's stick to the next stuff right now. Then. <laughs> Never mind. Um, 
Any other uh, questions or comments for Dr. Afi? Okay, we have a motion for Bob to uh, approve the uh, uh, recommendations for appointment or reappointment. Second. Second from Erica. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving uh, this list, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Dr. question. Because yes. since the last board meeting, I think we've launched the uh, telecardiology program. Yes, that's uh, correct. Is that still, it, it rolled out really well. Is it still working well? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we've, I think we've had like three or four telecardiology um, after our consults, and we are tracking how we're doing with those consults, um, both in terms of documentation, uh, as well as follow up what happens to the patient after the initial consult is placed. And so far, it's been very successful. And the emergency room has been um, very happy with the service, and uh, as well as how quick uh, the telecardiologists respond. So overall, I've heard uh, good feedback from everyone. Thank you for all your work on that. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, comments for Dr. Rafi? Thank you very much, Dr. Rafi. Thank you. All right, and uh, Dr. Martin isn't here tonight. All right. Is he on? Oh, he's going to try to dominate. Okay, so then uh, maybe. Uh, Julie, you'll be able to answer uh, John's question here. Um, I'm just curious as we, you know, uh, try to attract some additional providers, if, if we're seeing any change in the environment. I know some of the nursing, I felt like we're starting to fill some positions. Is there any traction with any of the providers? So I would say we, we've been saying only half jokingly that on the provider side, we have priority 1A, 1A, and 1A. Mm -hmm. um, which has been anesthesia, OB, and internal medicine. So um, the breakthrough we've had recently, and, and I don't know what counts for this shift, but um, for a while, you could not get family practice with OB. And, and in most urban and suburban settings, um, FP OB are not really a thing. It, they don't allow family practice to do OB. So that seemed to be a dwindling population. And we heard from one of the recruiters that, that, that there was some real interest in that and that I think it's the teaching health centers are graduating those students now. So we decided we would go out, um, use some of our recruiting firms to recruit for that. And I think Kat has two or three interviews for us now. And Dr. Merrill Stessel in particular is really enthusiastic about having FPOV staff. So, as we rebuild this OB program and looked at our opportunities there, Kat's been really busy with the locum and the 1099s helping keep that together. But FPOB seems to be looking really good. We have some new grad OBs that um, we're very enthusiastic about. Um, internal medicine still an absolute beverage there, but um, moving more in the direction of that adult medicine that we talked about rather than internal medicine. But um, we're certainly keeping that busy. And she was down in Utah and again at one of the, the big shows down there with all the merchandise and, and talking. Is she them. required to bring a new provider each time she returns home? <laughs> in a big suitcase. So, yeah. So um, it, it's feeling hopeful. It's be, and, you know, certainly. Between Catherine and Dr. Martin, they have, um, it, it's just all hands, it's all tools. So they're we're using the tools that Michelle has for us to advertise the recruitment firm, Catherine herself, and then you know, going to these shows. And the 501c3 oh, that's right. Too. Yeah, in fact, that seems to have opened up the uh, foreign possibilities of some other doctors too. Yeah, we had um, one pediatrician we were hoping was still going to be available when we got our final one, two, three times. We called her and she just started to talk, so we're, we're hoping that failed. <laughs> and um, oh. it's not a good fit because she, I think she'd rather come here. But yeah, that, that, thank you for that reminder. Yeah. That market will be huge for us. Uh, any other questions about Dr. Martin's report? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, next up we have finance, uh, CFO, Scott Olin. Yeah, um, if you'll start on page 55, which is our um, 
on these stats and um, uh, have been report we've been quite busy particularly when uh, that surge and this you um, you're over budget on patient days um, for the month uh, admission we've had some long length of stays which has uh, been a challenge too but I think we've been able to get safely discharge them uh, deliveries were a little off for the month uh, high case mix at 1.35 um, surgery was very busy this month. Um, inpatient right of budget, uh, outpatient procedures at uh, well in excess of budget, GI well in excess of budget. ER and urgent care were uh, a little softer than we'd expected. We budgeted uh, quite an increase over clear. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it was a little off in January. It seems to have turned uh, to work with what we expected in February. Problems. Um, lab all in all has been busy. Uh, diagnostic imaging, um, very good. Um, stay in your clinic visits, um, uh, a nice increase, a well in excess of budget for clinic visits. So with these um, with these stats, um, we have some a very positive revenue trends. And we'll jump over to page. See it, you will see that. See that we uh, wind down. We exceeded our revenue budget by 1.284 million. And uh, inpatient, inpatient was over budget, outpatient over budget, and professional services over budget on revenue. Um, the the uh, other operating revenue has. Uh, very common about the importance of the 340B program for us. Um, the pharmaceutical companies are continuing to make it you know, extremely challenging. And that negative variance and other operating rate revenue is uh, from contract funds, the uh, shortfall. We are going to make a change and um, and do 340B, 340B ESP, which is uh, a, a program the manufacturers have uh, uh, set up. And we were going to start to participate that we were very skeptical of it, skeptical of it last year and didn't want to participate. But some of the uh, collaborative hospitals have uh, have done it. And uh, and there's now actually when it was initially set up, you didn't have a business associate agreement that um, which is disclosing a lot of data. And without that, it just didn't seem right. So anyway, those uh, BAAs are now in place for it. So we're gonna, we think we'll capture some of that debt to what we have uh, going forward lost. When you make a decision to join a program like that, do you talk to other hospitals and see what their experience has been? Well, completely brand new for everybody. And uh, without, when we looked at it, it was uh, Raga and Nasser and I, we went through the, uh, the analysis. And, and one, we were just, Quite honestly, we didn't trust the pharmaceutical companies what they're going to do with the data, which was and it was everything. They, yeah. And, and then the other the other thing was uh, you know we asked reached out and said you know with what we're doing, we think there needs to be a business associate agreement in case of a breach of some sort. They can do a BAA. So that kind of was the tipping point for us to not participate. Ron, anything else? Well, I think we. They're kind of um, forcing us into a corner, yeah. you know, with the reduction in payments, but now we feel like we don't have a choice. But with them being willing to sign a BAA, we feel like it's worth doing. Thank you. You're um, On um, mm -hmm. expenses, um, expenses were over budget by uh, $1.1 million. Um, the one expense that kind of is, is consistent with what uh, Vicki and Nancy have spoken about is with temporary labor. Is uh, we had a, a, a variance here at two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars negative variance in temp labor. Um, our temp labor, if you recall from December, was nine hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars, and so we've uh, cut that temp labor in half for the month. And and actually, I think the we've uh, uh, Home Health had five or six temps. I think she brought us down to one, and we'll be. Done completely shortly. Um, uh, we've uh, there's a lot, quite a bit of template 
paper in the clinics, and most of those are gone. So we, um, I think, that, I think this template is going to come down even more um, and be like. So that's significant improvement on the other. Um, there's some um, trophies. There was um, some incentive accruals and severance things there. There was on supplies. There was some, um, as I mentioned, um, and reagents for COVID testing was $102,000. And Jeff uh, had an opportunity to take advantage of some pricing on uh, computers that he bought for twice the number of people. He buys computers twice a year normally. He bought uh, his whole allotment all at one time. So all in all, feel good about the trend. We are with expenses. Um, some of the expense variants were falling related. But uh, we ended up with a um, an operating loss of 393000 for the month. Um, the, the way we had budgeted for interest income is uh, trending as, as expected. So we had some interest income to offset this. Um, so we ended up with a net loss for, um, for January of $71,000. Can you just talk about that temporary labor for a moment? Because in the fourth quarter, we did a very deliberate decision the staff of using temporary labor, just looking at the a all the holes we had in our schedule, but the exhaustion level of our staff and and prior to that, we were using a lot of those incentive shifts to fill those, which was just compounding the exhaustion factor with our own staff. So we made the decision to do that. We may overshot it just a little bit, <laughs> but. I I just want to thank the senior leadership team and their directors because. They are a mature and sophisticated leadership team. And when we came to them in December and said it's time to start dialing it back, they didn't throw their arms up. They did, they they got to work filling those positions and getting creative about how they were going to do it. So um, it's a real trust as we do things like that. And they really step up and they did an amazing job. They do an amazing job of managing their expenses. Level. But I appreciate the fact that we can make that kind of decision um, and then not get, get bludgeoned, you know, as we say, okay, it's time to start. But I really appreciate that. So, um, just on uh, page uh, 57, um, you see what um, this is with some of the dashboards with the uh, revenue growth. We have uh, uh, some growth in the, age, the accounts receivable. Um, our uh, day's cash, uh, just with a lot of expense flowing through the uh, field, but our investments are remaining in a good spot. We have uh, shifted some, some funds over to, from just regular cash with the blue bar over to the green bar to take advantage of uh, about a 4% interest rate. And it's a very sh a good interest rate with uh, I can have the money out the next day. So we're trying to optimize that. So um, a, a loss report, but I think it's trending in a good direction for the age. Pick up on top of it. And that, that debt issue of the 15 million, uh, how are those annual things, like semi-annual, monthly? Has they are the, the principal and interest are the June 15th and the December 15th. So we are first one to come up this year. Are you going to need to talk about arbitrage? Um, we have uh, the answers, yes. Uh, we have uh, signed uh, an agreement to look at arbitrage for the existing debt, and we're going to have, I don't have the, the actual debt documents, official documents, but we have the answers, yes, we're going to do arbitrage because there will be like an issue with that. We'll probably mm -hmm. need mean, as much as we are now in the interest. Any questions that I can answer? Um, when Julie and I were doing the agenda review, we chatted about the financial woes, and we talked a little bit about how some of the hospitals are commenting about their losses, and they're not really clinical losses, but they're investment losses. And so consequently, people are upset at those hospitals uh, commenting about uh, and crying about their losses, but their investment losses. So, uh, what do you think about that, Scott? Or did you want to say something more about that, Julie? 
climate study that we've had uh, unrealized losses on KDH is best for the public district hospital. There is, we cannot be invested in the stock market. All of our investments are government securities. And so, although we've had unrealized actually gains and losses this month, there was an unrealized gain. Um, but uh, we've been somewhat uh, protected protected from some of the market swings that occurred. But those unrealized losses zero out as the instead of mature. Mature, mature, right? And so they don't they're just temporary on paper. Yeah, so, not real. so what Terry and I were talking about this analysis that, that you say included from the Washington State Hospital Association, that hospitals, not just Washington, but AJ has been out there really um, hammering home the notion that hospitals are losing a lot of money. And by the way, hospitals are losing a lot of money. We got out in front initially with losses that included huge investment losses on their uh, foundation fund and on their trucks. And they got uh, called on the Because yeah, those were invested in right. the so, stock market. Right. So the stock market took a hit. They came out and said, oh, look, hospitals are losing billions of dollars and the committee that they were testifying before said, well, that's only because you have a $35 billion foundation trust invested in the stock market. So these are operating losses. So so this is these are losses on health care in Washington State. But yeah, I, I think we got uh, up early on in, in this discussion about hospital losses being a little less in a little bit in January. Anyway, so I, I thought you guys might like to know about hospital losses could be in two different categories. And the clinical losses is something that we really want to push. And that was one of the things that the advocacy uh, uh, group, when they were talking to our legislator, was really pushing because they wanted to get Medicaid increase, uh, payments increased because that's a clinical loss that hurts us. And our investment loss is probably our own fault as opposed to our clinical loss. Okay. Yeah, thank you very for clarifying that. Okay. And then after the financial report, there is a Mitchell Rose's um, report. He's working on a couple of uh, working on a legislative branch. Um, we're hoping for a couple of million dollars and then um, another SAMHSA grant and other grant applications. Yeah. Can you remind me what the color means? Uh, on this report or on the, on the grant spreadsheet? Oh, I, I don't know that there is. I don't think there's, other than on the bottom of okay. the last page, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the left hand, the, the brownish red is a bold for uh, new new opportunities. And I think, I think other than that, um, I mean, different things he just needs to do internally to help himself. I think just to kind of differentiate is okay. 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 The code or a lot of opportunity right there. Yeah. On the case. The county commissioners. Um, the thank you for the happy Beach project as well. So, we'll mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Any other additional questions? Any other questions for Scott? Look after this one. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have the community relations report. Uh, Michelle, are you there? I am here. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. Um, let's see, I just want to add a couple of things to my report. First of all, Julie mentioned um, I am going to be reaching out to you for a groundbreaking, more of a photo op than event. Um, right before the March board meeting, I'm thinking approximately 430. But we'll be reaching out to make sure that that works with everybody. Um, thinking board members, Julie, Ron, our architects, and hopefully even our contractor and architect and or uh, contractor. So look for that. Um, I believe I put in my report that the electronic reader board is set to go up 
uh, Tuesday of next week. You may have noticed a poll driving in today if you saw that. Um, so work has already started, but the actual unit will be installed next week. And along with that, um, wanted to bring your attention as we go into March. March 19th will be the fourth anniversary of Deputy Thompson's um, death. And we were planning on flying the correct 35 flag on that day, as well as putting a message on the reader board. We were also going to put a message out to staff, just reminding them of why we are doing that. Um, and so we want, we, there was some um, situations last year where number one, we had the wrong flag and number two, we hadn't communicated effectively on what we were doing and why. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Oh, that's the first um, ad we're gonna put on our sign. Oh, Barrett. <laughs> that will be the first the, the first notice on our side um so we're pretty excited about that and and then in general you know it's going to be um, faces of providers events that we're doing so for example if we have a blood drive going on that type of thing um and so we're excited to be able to get just a wider message out there for people driving by it'll it'll be really cool we'll get some pictures going um, there'll be a lot of communication coming from us internally regarding Ron and his expansion project. Uh, when you talk about the MRIs coming in and the MRIs going out, that all has impacts on parking and things like that. So a lot of messaging going on right now regarding changes that staff can expect to see, as well as all the new providers coming in. So busy time. Any questions for me? Questions for Michelle? So the, uh, the rating um, program, it sounds like you're pretty happy with uh, how it's going, the rate rate. Absolutely. Um, I, I've made a rule for like the rest of the senior leaders, if they're having a bad day, they have to spend five minutes um, looking at the rate or rate reviews because it's, it's truly telling the story of what the majority of our patients um, feel. You, you can just see the turnaround of 90% of our ratings once we just actually ask people to do something are coming in at five stars. Uh, very few are at the one star. And what, what I'm finding very helpful is that if we do get a negative rating, um, most of what we're seeing is actually helpful information. And when, I, when we see those, we actually screenshot them and we send them to the area um, that it applies to. And quite often those also come with names. And so I know clinic managers or department managers, uh, quite often they're following up with these people uh, and using it as an opportunity to do some service recovery and to improve our operations. So real happy with that. Great, yeah. uh, remind me again, so you're a patient, you see someone, how, how is this communicated? How is so this what work? happens is um, Amy Diaz has a data file that dumps. So basically as a patient, if you attended your appointment, um, it happened the next day based on your communication method, either via an email or text in the vast majority or text, you get a text message that says, thank you for your visit with Dr. Dawson, please rate your experience. Um, and at that point they can click a star and um, it goes right now, it's all going to Google. I believe they're gonna start looking at some of the other health grades and things like that. Um, they can also click unsubscribe. I don't wanna get any more of these and they'll not get another one. Um, it happens and you won't get more than one every three months. So if you're coming in for multiple visits or something like that, um, it's a three month cycle before you get another one. Even if you're visiting a different clinic? Correct. Well, thank you, that's, that's great. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, all right, thank you, Michelle. Appreciate all right, it. thanks everybody. Okay, next up we have uh, education and board reports. So uh, Bob and Terry, you guys recently attended an AHA meeting. You can go, Bob, and I'll just back you up if I need to. Um, and then it was 82 degrees. And we got <laughs> and we um, it was actually a pretty good conference. Um, two takeaways that I thought were one of them was pretty profound, but 55% um, of all hospitals um, are losing money nationwide, right? Because it's down the pressure reimbursement, 
our increased disclosures. Um, several, so many talks on value based reimbursement, which is, you know, it's so vague. Uh, we just don't do it. I don't really know what it's going to look like, but we're pushing for that. You know, quality and customer service make the patient feel good, low cost. That's asking a lot. They talk about that quite a bit. Um, one of the things that I that they brought in the CEO for Uvalde, Texas, right? So, and he walked through the whole scenario and how that worked out. And um, I mean, what was it? 21 people died, two adults, 17 kids. Um, the hospital had no communication from the police department. How the hospital found out was their work employees. Okay. Hey, my son's there, my daughter's there. That's how the hospital found out. So uh, you had the best, but you also had 17 wounded people, which is another number we don't hear about. Um, and so this lack of communication was very much significant. Um, and, you know, triaging, they, they didn't even have a morgue. I mean, they, they were transfer, transporting people on a school bus because they would send the, the most acute to San Antonio, which is 80 miles away. Well, they're out of pictures. How many ambulances do you have? Um, so they, they learned a lot from that horrific experience, but um, how literally the police didn't even notify, even 911 didn't even notify the hospital that, hey, we have this going on. And how long it took to kind of get things going. Once the hospital was engaged, they did a call out for all the nurses. 100% of the nurses showed up, right? All the providers showed up. Uh, blood was a big issue, and they had a system that the um, ambulances carried blood with them. And so they were able to get blood to there as quickly as possible. And they engaged um, San Antonio, but that was an 80 80 mile drive to get San Antonio to transport people to level one tra trauma center. So a lot of terrible things happened, a lot of poor decisions. And one of the biggest ones was not letting the hospital know that hey, we've got something going on. It's really horrific. Was it an oversight? Was it intentional? Um, I just think he was way over his head, <laughs> uh, even you know, he like not going in when he should have gone to save lives and waiting for a SWAT team that took an hour and a half to, to get engaged. And it was just a really sad situation. The other thing that he said was they obviously brought in counselors for all the people that worked with them. Um, and they did that for a couple months. And then attendance started to kind of, you know, taper off. And at the six month mark, it really started to set in. They had a huge number of people who needed you know, counseling and debriefing and to be able to talk with us. So, you know, like, I think it's worthwhile. I mean, I hope no, nothing ever happens here, here in Ellensburg, but to uh, kind of have those scenarios in place of, uh, yeah, where, where is our board? Where, how much access do we have to blood? Um, you know, healthcare is unique that if there's really a, a crisis, the healthcare workers, they're going to show up. They don't care if they just pull, you know, three 24 hour shifts, they're going to show up and they're going to do the best that they, very, that they, that they can. But um, yeah, I, I thought it was a really interesting thing. I talked with him, the CEO, and then it was also the CEO of San Antonio Tra Level One Trauma Center talked and how they kind of worked things out. And, yeah. Hey, Bob, can I jump in here? Yeah. So I, I just wanted to welcome to my world of emergency preparedness. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to let you guys know the, these are the exact conversations when I talk about 
community exercises that we're doing with our partners. The um, drill that we did up at Central with the active shooter up there, we are engaging right now with the school district. Um, they're doing a couple of what, tabletops, which means we're sitting around talking about this scenario. And then it'll culminate in a live drill this summer where we actually um, do the run through. And these are the exact conversations that we're having. Um, when first responders are on scene, um, they're doing their jobs, you know, like we're doing our jobs in the emergency room. And unfortunately, um, one of the things we find all the time is the police are responding to the incident. Mac is overwhelmed, or, or sorry, Kitcom 911, they're overwhelmed once the responses come in. And it really is through radio traffic and through victim traffic and staff traffic that we as hospitals start hearing um, and our partners understand, you know, we've had conversation on how long does it take to thaw plasma? Um, it, it's not something that we can just do where blood might be more readily available. And so these are conversations that we're consistently having. And just like COVID and the way that our community partners came together, um, we all echo the sentiment that we never want to see something like this, but we're gonna do absolutely everything we can to prepare and respond. Yeah, it was really informative. And their hospital is a little bit smaller than ours, but the community is about the same size as what, what we are. Um, the, yeah, value based reimbursements. Um, another interesting topic was um, venture capital is moving into the healthcare arena, which they just molest. Healthcare. I mean, they come in, they buy, they spend big, big money, they eat whatever they can out of it, run it to the ground, and then turn it back over. I mean, that's um, it's all about money and profits. And so, being aware of, and even in Washington State, there are venture capital groups who buy practices, right? And they buy practices and they Try to squeeze as much money as they can out of it before they totally dump it and move on to the next thing. So that's nationwide, but getting bigger and bigger. Um, and then uh, violence in the workplace, which is something that we're on top of, but it's real. Violence coming from patients and then interacting violence, but um, you know the, the trauma that that can cause. And toler tolerating people that really. We shouldn't be tolerating at all. We should not have. We should ban these people or have them have a you know have them provide some of that you know, walking through the system or someone who's you know, protecting them. Um, and I think we have you know, security was is a good move. Have security as much as possible, but. It's just it's just security. Yeah. Something really bad happens. And, you know, if he can inter, intervene a little bit, but he doesn't really have any anything behind him other than calling the police. And that's happening more and more across the country. Is you know violence happening in the emergency room? Violence happening. You know, once they're even. In the hospital, and uh, it's sad, but it's the reality. So it's not just unique to us; it's nationwide. This is happening. Um, yeah, that's about it. It was it was a pretty good uh, conference, and, uh, but and it seems like every other session was value based care, value based care, value based care, <laughs> and it seems like they're they're pushing that big time, but yet they don't want to define it. And so, well, value-based care, but we're not going to tell you what that means. And what is Been there, done that? Or what do you mean? <laughs> All right, so, Terry, do you want to? I have uh, one. I'm going to try to be short on this. I went to a pre-conference workshop that they had down there, and it was navigating the top three threats facing America rural hospitals. The three set, uh, 
threats are workforce, financial challenge, and external threats. And interesting, uh, the first one, workforce, the uh, big things they talked about was loss of job independence. And then they also said the new normal of healthcare is impacting the youth wanting to work in healthcare. That's why we're having problems getting them. And then they also said artificial intelligence, AI, is starting to help providers to be more automatic. And then they said uh, in the financial challenges, uh, you know, you were talking about 55% uh, lost money. They were saying that one of the big challenges is the pressure on re reimbursement. Uh, and then um, uh, the other thing is that they said that something that uh, uh, makes more money are ancillary services that increase the amount of money in hospitals. So all our ancillary services that we do here uh, possibly can increase our amount of money. And then the, uh, uh, the other one, the external threats were a little interesting. Uh, social determinants of the health. But then they said the other one was competition with those outside of healthcare. And they said the dollar store in the United States is going to have a clinic in their parking lot. So consequently, that should have some impact. So anyway, those were the, uh, those were the uh, top three uh, threats facing American hospitals in the United States. And I just thought you might like to find out what those top three sets are. And the one that really impacts me is the youth uh, wanting to work in healthcare. Because uh, back when I was a little boy, I thought healthcare would be really good. Uh, and when I talk to my grandchildren, uh, they aren't sure if they want to be in healthcare. Uh, so th this is, a lot of this has been, uh, long-term COVID because that's what's impacted us is the COVID uh, pandemic is impacting a lot of things, even though these three top uh, threats of us weren't infected by the COVID vaccine, but they, uh, not the vaccine, the virus, but they were uh, uh, increased by the, the pandemic. So anyway, I just thought you might find that interesting. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Can I one more thing? Yeah. So, and kudos to senior leadership and what we're doing, you know, uh, and Michelle, as far as like um, volunteer opportunities, early volunteer opportunities with high school kids or college kids to get them in, into the hospital to um, have that exposure. And then, um, the other thing, and we're doing that. The other thing is taking on the payers. Like, don't let them bully, bully. And we're doing that too, right? It's tough to vision, but you, you know, they're not so in a real partnership. Uh, sometimes you have to break away. And then the workplace violence, which we've had all those conversations in this last year, an ongoing conversation. So we're doing all those things that we're trying to get everybody else to do. Um, and it's, I, I, I it was validated of it. We need the workplace violence. I, I think we have made such strides. It's such an unpredictable environment, but we have made such strides with our staff, I think, and just reinforcing with them. We do not, we have a zero tolerance yeah. for that kind of behavior at a registration desk in that. I was reading a verge today, an MA reporting on this event that happened, and I was so impressed with how poised she was and how she handled it. Um, and she's an MA of press. Um, how poised she was, but how sure she was that this was the right thing to do. That nobody was going to say, oh, he's an old man. What do you mean? You know, it's like, no, she no. knew yep. we don't tolerate this. And it's, you can't, you cannot grind your staff down by accepting that kind of, of, you know, that kind of input to your environment. So I really applaud the staff for stepping up and yeah. insisting that, that 
they don't put up with that. It's yeah. really valid going to like some of these meetings and we have these, you know, um, speakers that are prominent in the field of healthcare, and they're saying this, things that we're doing. Really, just, just related to pay behavior, there's um, one of the challenges that we've recently had is um, on a lot of the payers are doing that for infusions and things like that. It's uh, they're specifying specific site of service locations that you can only administer this medication at uh, a outpatient and treatment center or something like that. And so, I've got a, a, a draft letter that I've to send to the insurance com the uh, insurance companies and to the Office of Insurance Commissioner and the Healthcare Authority, and basically say that we are asking the insurance companies to exempt KDH from these site of care requirements for the reason that uh, you're requiring the patient to go over a mountain pass, either over to Snoqualmie, a mountain pass to Seattle, or a mountain pass to um, uh, Wenatchee, or over Highway 82. And that for Medicaid patients, they're indigent to start with. You're, it's a financial hardship for individuals to go over someplace else. And so I'm, I'm asking for an exemption, and I'm hoping that the, uh, the, uh, and then I just said that to, you know from the insurance OIC's perspective, I said, um, you know that you have to have network adequacy, and if you're directing your patients over someplace else, do you have a network here? So anyway, just uh, the, the the fight is ongoing. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really it, so the rural collaborative has a revenue integrity committee, and he's sort of the revenue integrity committee bulldog. He made them all adopt. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. <laughs> what was it? Your it was the the principles of principles of contracting. Yeah. contracting. Yeah. I think a lot of these things, like what works to our advantage, is the elms were still. A, community and you know you can have like you could be living close to san antonio and you're still san antonio but we're Ellensburg and we are a community looking at the best interests of our patients and, and yeah. actually you know, fighting the insurance company of our neighbors we're, our and we're trying to look out for the interests of our families yeah so it was a good conference it was a 82 degrees. <laughs> yeah. We can fly if you want. One more thing. I went to a, uh, uh, a, a, a meeting that they were talking about value based, like Bob said that there's a lot of meetings about that. And uh, the uh, one of the things that the, the person said that people have complained a lot about the CEO. <laughs> Not communicating, communicating enough with the people in the hospital that that will help value base. And I I told Julie uh, that she communicates wonderfully because I really think she does. And I also uh, got to zoom in the employee forum uh, and watch it from San Antonio. And uh, those employee forums are very good, and that way she communicates. And there's so many people that will zoom into those forums. So we, you communicate very well with our employees, but consequently, uh, I cannot imagine that anybody would complain that you don't communicate enough, but you might have some goofy people out there say, you talk too much, but I do not believe that you talk too much. So anyway, I just thought that was something that was kind of interesting. So thank you for being such a great communicator. Julie. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Terry and Bob. Appreciate it. Um, a couple of uh, upcoming conferences. There's this uh, AHA annual meeting in Washington, D.C. If you, I'm going there. I think Julie's going. If you would like to go, please notify Justin before the uh, early bird uh, deadline. Of what's, what's the date? Uh, it's April 23rd to 25th. So Sunday, too. Yeah, well, that's the one that's 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 and then uh, so someone they usually have, they have. Yeah, COVID. so and I would just mention that uh, we have not heard from the Washington State Hospital Association yet, but the conferences on Tuesday, and if you'll recall, 
Um, you usually do your town visits with your friendly federal lobbyists from Washington, D.C. on Tuesday afternoon. I wish I had not said whether they're going to do that this year. Um, so the conference ends Tuesday, um, but again, used to the Hill visits would be Tuesday. I should talk to you about that because place. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the place or if you put another answer. Okay. So uh, uh, so we'll be in touch with you about yeah. that. Uh, and then there's a AHA leadership summit that's actually going to be in Seattle in July. Um, it's the uh, same month as that is later in the month in Chelan, I believe. I forget if that's end of June or early July. But anyway, um, that's something to keep in mind. It is uh, semi local. So, anyway, just uh, keep that in mind. There's an early bird on the second of June. I had to go get for it. Was it? I forget. I mean, I can. For the leadership for the, Yeah, for the one in Seattle, it's uh, June 2nd. Is, is early. You save 100 bucks if you. I'd, I'd have to go check. I don't know. Well, uh, it looks to me like it's 27. June 26 to the 28th. With the 26th being a, not a Monday. official day. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, anyway, keep those in mind. Uh, no, no old business and new business. We have the one day board retreat. You want to talk about? Yeah, so um, I was in contact with the Canyon River Ranch for a one day board retreat. They'll have the entire uh, lobby area and then a big boardroom uh, that seats up to 20, um, you know, kind of on breakfast and a lunch and stuff like that. Um, that, that they could have us be there on June 3rd or June 10th. It just depends on which dates you guys would prefer. Those are Saturdays. Um, and Where would that be again? What's that? Where would the retreat be? It's again? the Canyon River Ranch. Down uh, the canyon. Uh, oh, down, yeah, yeah, down, 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 down the, the Yakima Canyon. Yeah. yeah. Right. Is that the same place Red. that yeah, previously? Okay. Just what were the two options? Uh, so it's June 3rd or June 10th. Both dates are still available as of like, yesterday, day before. So. Are you wanted, do you guys, the, do the senior leaders, have any preference? Oh, thanks. Think they're gonna go when you tell us we're gonna be there. <laughs> anybody anybody yeah. have a date that either of those they can't make? You could make either. But I could make either one. Okay. Yeah. Check my schedule. Yeah, it looks like I could make either one too. Does this ever happen that we have two very well say that's that's just a big problem over that's correct. So we would anticipate arriving at eight o'clock in the morning or whatever for breakfast and staying until two or three o'clock in the afternoon. We're looking at food and coffee and all that. Um, uh, we have invited Trisha and Jason to be directly. And um, Dr. Martin and I are talking about whether adding some of our position leaders might be there. So 18 to 20 people. They did say that going past you know the 15, 16, 17, 18 mark, then you kind of tight the board table just for the space that they have available. Uh, so just keep that in mind with how many folks we invite. Okay. So uh we'll pick a date and let you know. Do you want to uh Bob, do you want to wait a day or two to confirm? I can next to tomorrow. I'm oh, sorry. You can yeah, uh, just since, our, since, since we're all set you can probably just notify Justin. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we'll just do, if if you have a preference, then we'll go with your preference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so really three years old or ten years old. So uh, Julie, was there anything else we wanted to do about the work retreat here? Okay. I was going to say they're really proud about their cookies, so be careful. Seven bucks a cookie. Seven bucks a cookie. Okay. Bring our own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Is there anything else for the go to the order before we go to the executive session? Uh, how long do you think we need? That's it. Yeah. All right. So let's take a take a ten minute break so we can get some eat in ten minutes. Uh, so let's let's say seven uh, seven ten. We'll be back.